Thank you, Dr. Panosian. It's uh, uh, really a, an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm going to give you a little background of how we came about to do this Armenian Genome Project. And uh, you'll see that over quite a few years, I've gotten very involved in the Armenian community, uh, both locally and, and also overseas. Um, I am not of Armenian descent uh, myself, but I've been told uh, by my fellow Armenians that I, I'm an ABC, Ar Armenian by choice. <laughs> so, and I do feel very, very close to the community. Uh, as um, my friends here, there's many of them here know, I'm actually Jewish and there are many commonalities between the two groups, as, as I'm sure you, you know. Um, I have not been familiar with the ARPA group, and in your dis um, description of it, I think it's extremely relevant to our project. You will see that um, part of our project is really basic research to examine the, uh, the Armenian genome and how it came to be and how it's different from European and other genomes. But uh, another large part of this project, which is funded by philanthropy so far, is uh, much like the ARPA mission, is to transfer technology from our UCLA group to uh, Yerevan and other areas, but primarily the Medical School and Molecular Biology Institute in Yerevan, so that they can start doing um, clinical genomics uh, themselves. So I think it, it, um, it works very nicely in parallel with ARPA, and so I hope this will be a start of a, a continuing partnership. So I know we have uh, in the audience, there are some medical people, but also uh, scientists from many other fields. So um, just a little basic introduction to what, what genomics is. Uh, it's the study of all the chromosomes in a species uh, and all the genes in an organism. And for tonight's purposes, we're talking about homo sapiens, uh, humans. Uh, the genome is essentially the full complement of DNA making up all the chromosomes in the nuclei of all of our cells. And it can be used for research purposes, uh, which is part of what we're doing as this project, but also medical applications. And I will show you how the latter has uh, led us into the Armenian uh, Genome Project. Um, at the time I um, finished my training at UCLA, molecular diagnostics was just starting to be talked about. This was the mid-1980s. And so I founded the Molecular Diagnostic Lab at UCLA. And uh, as some of my close friends here know, uh, it was like the size of a closet back then with half a technician, no funding whatsoever. We had one test. Uh, but over the last 30 years or so, uh, we've moved quite a bit forward. We started doing just single genes, single mutations, then multiple genes, multiple mutations. And then in the last six years, uh, we were actually the first center in the United States to start offering clinical grade genome-wide sequencing, which are the techniques in, in pink at the bottom there. And that's what has led kind of indirectly to the, um, the Armenian Genome Project. So about six years ago, I saw my field that I had been in for so long and was really one of the founders of move from what I call molecular medicine, which was examining one gene, one disease at a time, like to, to diagnose a patient with cystic fibrosis, for example. We're only going to look at that one gene. Now we have the technology and the knowledge to look at all the genes. There's about 23,000 of them in the genome. We can't really look at all the diseases yet. Only about one-fifth of those genes have a direct disease association. But in the course of our regular clinical work and other labs like ours around the world, um, almost every week a new disease gene is being discovered. For our own lab, which is not even that high volume, I'd say once every two to three months we publish a paper of a new disease gene association. This could not have happened without the completion of the Human Genome Project which was, of course, a worldwide effort. This is the timeline that I'm not going to go through in detail, but the highlights are it was launched in 1990, uh, and it was meant to be a 15-year project to finish in 2005. It actually finished two years early, and it had a budget of $3 billion, as I've highlighted here. So you could say that it took uh, 13 years and $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. Uh, my labs at UCLA have sometimes been accused of having um, overly high prices, which we have no control over, it's set by the hospital, and sometimes they complain about our turnaround time, but it's never been 
$3 billion in, in 13 years. Obviously, that would be of no use in a clinical setting. But over the, the years since then, uh, the technology has gotten faster and cheaper, like technology always does. And um, we're now in the realm where we can look at a person's whole genome for a few thousand dollars and a turnaround time of uh, a few days to, to a week. Um, for any of the pediatricians in here, we can do stat clinical genome analysis. Uh, we really are selective because it requires shutting down everything else in our lab. And we, we can turn it around in as quickly as two or three days. We mostly use that for newborns in the neonatal ICU and ICU who are, are very ill and they really want to make a major management decision right away. So we will do a stat clinical genome. But other than that, the typical turnaround time is now running about three weeks, four weeks, which is much faster even than it was when we started. It was 12 weeks. <coughs> Um, the other thing that had to change, in addition to our knowledge of the whole genome sequence, and we needed that because when we sequence the patient's genome, we need to, com uh, to compare it to a so-called normal genome, and we wouldn't have had that without the completion of the Human Genome Project. In addition, the technology had to change. So this is Sanger sequencing. I won't go through the actual nuts and bolts of it. It was the workhorse for 20, 30 years in molecular biology um, for sequencing genes, usually one gene at a time because it was relatively slow. It, it was the technique used for the Human Genome Project, and that's why it took 13 years, even with hundreds of labs working in parallel. Uh, this will give you about 200 nucleotides of sequence in one run of a couple days. The entire genome is 3.3 uh, billion nucleotides, so this would be really slow. So around 2008, 2009, we saw the advent of new DNA sequencing platforms. This was just the first one by a company called Solexa. They've since been absorbed by a big company that's probably the leader now called Illumina. They're, they're based in San Diego. But this was their first advertisement in some of the journals, and as you can see, they can do one billion nucleotides in one run. And now that has been way superseded. You can do 20 billion easily in one run. So you can do several pe people's genomes uh, all at once uh, in a single run. So it's called next generation sequencing, or NGS. That's the slang term. The, the real term is massively parallel DNA sequencing. Because unlike Sanger sequencing, where you're honing in on one little part of one gene, in NGS, you're busting up the whole genome into hundreds of millions of small fragments, and each of those is being sequenced many times in parallel. Uh, and the computer, at the end, takes those, by now, hundreds of billions of fragments and manages to put them back together, reconstructing the whole genome, and then comparing it to the reference genome, which is the um, the 19th generation product of the original Human Genome Project. So that's the difference, and that's why we're now in genomic medicine. If you were to walk through our lab, you might not notice that it had changed much. The instrument at the top is from Applied Biosystems, which is what we do the Sanger sequencing on. The one at the bottom is from Illumina, uh, which we do the uh, next generation sequencing. And they don't look all that different, even to me. Um, the big difference of them is really in the background. There's a huge computer server for the one at the bottom because you get, um, from any one genome sequence, the raw data takes about five terabytes of computer memory. So when we started doing this six years ago, I think within the first month we had um, outstripped all of the computer memory on the entire UCLA campus. <laughs> we had to go elsewhere. Now, of course, Amazon has the cloud. And, it's become much e easier, but in those days it wasn't so easy. Um, it's changed the way I interpret the clinical sequences in a way I'm not so happy about, but there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, for those of you who are in molecular biology, you'll recognize this as the Sanger sequence that comes off of the uh, Applied Biosystems uh, instrument. It just shines a laser through the um, elongating DNA chain, and there are four colors for the four nucleotides, A, C, G, and T. And what I like about it is, although the instrument will give me the letters, if I suspected anything was not quite right or it was a dirty run, 
I can look at this raw data myself and, and <coughs> sequence just as well as the instrument can. The raw data you get off of the Illumina instrument um, doesn't quite look like this. It, it looks like this. It's called a cluster array. You'll notice it's the same four colors, but uh, I would challenge any of you to look at this and give me the DNA sequence. I couldn't do it. Also, you'd have to do it very fast because this photo lasts about one nanosecond and then it adds hundreds of millions of the next nucleotide and takes another flash photo. That's why you need the computer power. Um, I will mention, because this is what we're also doing on the Armenian samples for research, we and most other labs like ours have decided that for now we're not going to sequence the whole genome. We're only going to look at the coding regions of genes. Those are called exons, and uh, the aggregate of all of them together, there's about 250,000 of them, is the exome. That equals only 1% of the genome. The rest of the genome, we don't really know what it does. I'm sure it's important, or it wouldn't have been replicated for all these billions of years. That, that takes a lot of the cell's energy. But we really have no idea what happens out there. Many people call it junk DNA. I don't like that. I'm sure it's not junk. We just don't know what it does. So um, by focusing on the coding regions of genes, it's much easier to see a, a mutation that really is going to change the function of the gene and the protein. So um, also it's cheaper because you're only sequencing 1% of the genome. I think within a few years we will move into genome. And certainly for the research samples I'm going to talk about, we, we can do that any time we want. We, we have the DNA. So uh, these are the clinical applications of next-gen sequencing at the moment. Uh, tonight we're focusing only on genetic disorders. Those are something in the person's DNA in all of their cells. Uh, the same techniques we're using in tumors. We can sequence tumor DNA. There we're looking for acquired mutations that are only in the tumor and might be targets of some of the new cancer drugs. What we call them druggable targets but I'm not talking about that tonight. And then in obstetrics, this technology has revolutionized prenatal testing. All of the amniocentesis they used to do, which involved putting a needle into the uterus and the amniotic sac, and there is a small but real risk of causing a miscarriage. Now with this technology, you can just draw a blood sample from the arm of the pregnant mother, peripheral blood, and it can sequence the fetal DNA that is floating around in the mother's blood, and so you don't have to go anywhere near the fetus, and the uptake for that has been very enthusiastic. Um, but we're focusing only on the genetics today. This is a, a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association we published after the first few years of our experience, uh, how this um, was successful in diagnosing patients who've gone many years without a diagnosis. They had many single gene genetic tests, and many MRIs and x-rays, and all of them were negative or inconclusive. Uh, we, what they had been on in those years, we call it the diagnostic odyssey. And it's very frustrating for the families, and it's very expensive for the insurance. Um, we found that this one test, in quite a few cases, can end the diagnostic odyssey. This is our diagnostic yield, and this is reflected now across the country. It's roughly 25 to 50 percent positive yield uh, that we will get um, of a patient that's been undiagnosed for many years. We will find a mutation in a, a gene that, that explains the, the clinical symptoms. Why is it 25 to 50 percent? So the, the blue slice here is where it's a known mutation that's already been published. The, uh, the sort of greenish one next to that is um, it's just not a known mutation yet, but it's in a gene that makes a lot of sense. So I'm sure that almost all of those also are the right diagnosis, but we're kind of conservative of how we write the reports. So that's just the background of the genomic methods we've been using, and this is much of what I would like to transfer to Yerevan as, as the time comes. When I visited there, I'll show you a couple pictures later um, with, with Selby. Uh, when was it, last, last year? Or, yeah, or the year before, okay. We're supposed to go back this year. Yeah, it was my first trip. I loved it, really. I told people it was my favorite country overseas, except for maybe Italy, but, but <laughs> it's at least second, maybe first. Um, and, uh, you know, they, we saw in their facilities there, they have an Illumina instrument, but the reagents are so expensive and to us as well, but to them it's outrageous that uh, at least at the time we went, they hadn't even turned the instrument on. They'd had it just sitting there for a year. And I, 
I don't blame them. The minute you turn on these instruments, it's costing you thousands of dollars. And if you don't fill up all the wells in it, you're wasting a lot of money. That's just the way they work. But I'm hoping we can get things cheaper for them. So how did this lead into the Armenian Genome Project? So uh, Dr. Panosian mentioned I also do, do some clinical genetics. And um, one of the diseases I see quite a lot of patients for in our medical genetics clinic is um, the so-called Armenian disease or the Yerevan disease. Uh, I don't like to call it that. As you'll see, it, it affects many other ethnic groups as well, um, which is familial Mediterranean fever. And um, I see the pediatric uh, <coughs> cases in our medical genetics clinic. The adult cases uh, for many decades have been seen in the Department of Medicine, Division of Digestive Diseases. And about 20 years ago, the directors of that uh, clinic uh, contacted our medical genetics division and told us that um, they would like one of the clinical geneticists to attend this monthly clinic um, because since it is a genetic disease. And since my lab was already doing the DNA testing for the FMF gene uh, and finding mutations, I, everyone sort of looked at me and as the volunteer. Um, I didn't want to go initially. I had many misgivings about it. I figured um, a clinic that's seeing the same disease year after year, that's going to get very boring. Turned out it's not boring at all. Every patient was different. We had, this morning I had this clinic and all four patients were different and very challenging. Also, when I was in medical school, my least favorite uh, specialty was internal medicine. So I tried to stay away from adult medicine for quite a while. Uh, but it turned out the directors of, of this lab are, uh, were very nice. Now, the two founders, who were very prominent gastroenterologists, um, passed away a few years ago. So as shown here, uh, a younger gastroenterologist, Terry Getzo, uh, is the director, and I'm the co-director. Um, this is the only clinic of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, to get a comparable clinic, you, you'd probably have to go to Israel, or there might be, a, I hate to say it, but there's a big one in Turkey. Um, but I, I, at least for, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm well aware of the history. Um, it, this is certainly the only one of its kind in the United States, and we get patients from Michigan and all over the place uh, coming to see us. Um, just a quick review for those who are not in the medical field and don't see these patients. And I, I've been amazed that many Armenian Americans have never heard of this disease. I, I think it was sort of a taboo subject going back hundreds of years. Uh, and it's just not talked about. So um, the basics are it's a recessive disorder like cystic fibrosis. The parents are carriers. They're totally healthy. They have a one in four chance by Mendel's laws to have an affected child with each pregnancy. It's in a larger family of periodic fever uh, syndromes, of which there's about eight of them. Uh, but this is by far the most prevalent. And in Los Angeles, it's really by far since we have so many Armenians. But as shown here, Although Armenians have the highest carrier rate, it is found in many other groups from the Middle Eastern area, Jews, both Sephardic and Ashkenazi, Turks, Arabs, Italians, Greeks, Iraqis, Iranians. But I've also seen um, pure Japanese, pure Chinese. In our clinic today, we had someone Indonesian. That was the first time I ever saw it and, and definitely had FMF. Um, it's not as common in those groups. This carrier rate of one in five is, is really remarkable. Um, you know, the carrier rate for cystic fibrosis in this country is like one in 30. Um, Tay-Sachs disease in Ashkenazi Jews is like one in 30. The one in five is unheard of. I mean, I always thought the most common carrier state of a recessive disease was probably sickle cell disease in Africa, where it's one in 10. And there, as uh, many of you know, there there's a selective advantage for that, although the sickle cell disease itself is horrible, even in this country and, and in rural Africa, it's just fatal all the time. The carriers actually have a selective advantage. They're relatively resistant to malaria, and that's why um, that mutation has been selected for. Why this, which is twice as high uh, in the Armenian population, we don't, there's never been any evidence that the carriers have any advantage for FMF, their immune systems seem to be the same as anyone else. I think it's a founder effect, and hopefully our genome project may explain that. Uh, that's the same as Tay-Sachs in the Ashkenazi population. There's no advantage to that either. It's just that 
the, the ethnic group was founded by a small number of families and you know some of them had the mutation and they've just stayed within that group forever. Both of our groups have had what we call a genetic bottleneck, namely genocide, which made it an even a smaller group, that, so you have yet another founding event. And I think that's why it's so common. I don't think there's any selective advantage. Just little basics of the disease. Um, it is a periodic fever. Usually the first symptoms are in childhood. But I, my youngest patient I've ever diagnosed was um, four month old. And the oldest patient I ever diagnosed was 45 years old. Now I think that person was in denial for a long time. The median age of onset is like early adolescence, 10, 11, 12. And uh, it's fever roughly once a month, although that can vary, but the textbook is roughly once a month. Some patients, it's really like clockwork. They, they can put on their calendar when the next one is going to come. And they're really unbearable. Uh, fever's up to 104, 105, and horrible abdominal pain that looks like acute appendicitis, but it's not. There's no infection at all. It's just inflammation. Many of the patients, when they go to the ER, at least years ago, would get taken to the operating room and have their appendix removed and it, there was nothing wrong with the appendix. And if the ER doctor had simply taken a history, they would have known that a month ago the patient had the same thing and the month before that and the month before that. Acute appendicitis doesn't act like that. You, you come in and they either would take it out or it bursts. So um, they would know it couldn't have been appendicitis. Some of the patients get inflammation of the lining of the lungs, pleuritis lining of the heart, pericarditis, which would give chest pain. And then there's um, an abnormal protein called amyloid that is silently deposited in the kidneys and liver over many years and if untreated can lead to kidney failure, which is the main cause of death of untreated FMF patients. Um, what I learned uh, when I started attending this clinic was that um, although rheumatologists often see FMF patients, they're not all that informed about it. They mainly treat autoimmune diseases, which is the body attacking itself. Diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. FMF and the other periodic fevers are auto-inflammatory disorders. There are no lymphocytes attacking the body. The cells here uh, that are at fault are um, neutrophils, which, which are the ones that normally respond to infection. And um, all you're getting is um, uh, some subclone of the neutrophils on a regular circadian rhythm for unknown reasons starts proliferating, releasing all of its cytokines which cause all the fever and pain. But uh, as if you're, you have a bacterial infection, but there is no infection. But the body's acting as if there is. And these episodes uh, last about two to four days and there's nothing you can do to make them any shorter. Uh, but after that, the they spontaneously feel fine and get out of bed and go back to work. But the pain during the attack is described uh, as horrible. Uh, the worst pain uh, I think anyone imagines. I mean, worse than labor pains, at least talking to women who've had it. Um, they rate it 10 plus out of 10 on the pain scale. I've had adult patients who went many years without diagnosis and they told me many times they considered suicide because this was so unbearable. And it's really a shame to be undiagnosed because it's easily treatable once you make the diagnosis, as I'll show you. Um, this is the inflammasome, <laughs> kind of like the genome, but this is all of the genes and proteins that are involved in inflammation. I don't understand this at all. I'm just showing you how complex it is. <laughs> but somewhere within here is the FMF gene, which is called pyrin, meaning heat uh, for the um, fever. So it was um, discovered in 1997, and that's one reason I got involved in it. I wasn't involved in the gene mapping, but some geneticists right down the street from us at Cedars-Sinai were, along with an Israeli group. And uh, they found it, uh, but the people at Cedars didn't want to offer it as a clinical test, so they passed it to me. So we were one of the very first places to start offering it. Um, and there's a database that keeps track of all the mutations, which is free, anyone can go there. Um, this is a map of the gene, just, just for your interest. Um, uh, one thing I learned attending in the FMF clinic was um, the DNA test is not always that useful. It's mostly a diagnosis based on the patient's history. Um, it turns out about one third of the patients that we're sure have FMF, um, we do the test and we only find one mutation, one mutant gene. 
Now I've told you this is a recessive disorder. There should be two mutant genes, one from the mother, one from the father. Our test can't look at all the parts of the gene. It's not clear if we're missing it or it's somewhere else, uh, but this has been known worldwide. Um, in fact, I think this is a group from Turkey. That I, I just like the title of this where they say, where is the second hit? We don't know. But um, So I'll test an Armenian patient um, and you'll get one mutation. And does that mean they have FMF? No, because one in five Armenians are going to be carriers anyhow. So I really base it mostly on the history. Um, this just shows why we don't know what the other uh, genes are, the other mutations. It may be technical, we're just not sure. So it's really a, a diagnosis based on history of the clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, it helps if you can see the patient during an acute attack, but I rarely do because they are so miserable they can't get out of bed. They're in the fetal position. If you even touch their bed, they hit the ceiling. If they ride in a car, every bump is, is, um, is just uh, unbearable to them. Um, so instead of genetic testing, we'll just start usually a trial of the therapy. And if it works, it makes the diagnosis. So the therapy is the drug colchicine. It's a very ancient drug, been used for 2,500 years to treat gout. It's been used for about 60 years to treat FMF. Um, it was discovered purely by accident. There's a very elderly professor at Harvard, now emeritus now, Dr. Goldfinger, um, rheumatologist, so he was treating gout patients. And one patient um, he had, an adult man, he put him on colchicine, which is one, one of the ways to treat gout. There, there are other drugs. When the patient came back in six months, he said, doctor, this drug is amazing. Not only is my big toe not swollen and red anymore, I'm not getting these fevers every month, which has nothing to do with gout. So it turned out that patient also had FMF, and the, the one drug uh, treated both disorders. So the, that was, oh boy, I think 71 or something like that. It was published as a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. Goldfinger is the name. The difference with gout, the gout people take colchicine when they feel an attack coming on. Um, that doesn't help for FMF attacks. Once the attack starts, there's no way to stop it. But you can prevent it by taking colchicine every day of their life. And um, that, that's pretty much what the um, FMF patients do. And um, you know, we, once they're under control, we just see them once a year. Um, it, for your interest, it, it's a natural product, or at least it was originally from the crocus uh, flower. And you know, the ancient Greeks uh, knew about it. So how does this lead into the genome project? Um, so uh, I met Salpi uh, about four years ago uh, when the uh, Armenian Medical World Congress which we just had a few months ago in Buenos Aires, but uh, two congresses before that were in Hollywood. And I was invited to give a talk on FMF, and that was really the first time I got to know the, other than our Armenian patients, the, the real leaders in the Armenian community here. And uh, through Salpi, I got to meet a lot of leaders in the community. And around the year of the genocide anniversary, 2015, a daughter of a genocide survivor uh, who had written this book about her father, uh, Sarah Chichian, wrote the book, um, decided to give a gift to um, launch this Armenian Genome Project. And it, it's really two equal parts between UCLA and the Armgenia uh, Trust, uh, which is based in Yerevan. Um, it was a big deal right toward the end of 2015. It, we felt it was important to do this during the anniversary year and not wait till the next year. And so we had a very nice signing ceremony at uh, UCLA. Uh, I'm there on the right. Dr. Coates um, right next to me is uh, our chief of um, world health right at UCLA. And uh, Savak Avajian uh, is the next one. He had been minister of health uh, in Armenia for many years. and. Uh, Evgeny uh, uh, Sakarenko, who is actually Ukrainian, but is the son-in-law of, uh, of Sabak, uh, came down also. He's at University of Washington, so it's easy to collaborate with him. And uh, this is just the cover of the brochure that was made for the Armgenia project. And I, I didn't think of this phrase, but I, I love it. It's very poignant. Genetic mapping of the fractured homeland. These are the goals to determine genetic variants specific to the Armenian population, 
to identify genetic markers to improve ancestry analysis and hereditary disease diagnosis in Armenians in Armenia and in the diaspora and Los Angeles. And then, as I mentioned, to exchange technological expertise so they can start doing this themselves. Why do I think Armenian genome is so special? And I, I actually didn't start out as a population geneticist. I don't claim to be one. Um, but I do think the Armenian population is very unique. Uh, and you know many what social ways it's unique, and the food is great. Um, but I think it's unique in another way. Uh, it's been an isolated, genetically isolated population for thousands of years. We used to say 5,000, but now there's a paper that says 7,000, I think. And that's rare on planet Earth. And it helps for genetic studies to have pure populations. That's why we do so much in mice, because you can breed mice totally inbred where they're all exactly alike. It's hard to find humans like that. And I'm not claiming all Armenians are alike. But compared to other populations, their genomes are likely to be more similar and therefore easier to analyze, I hope. I, again, this is not my main expertise. Um, the, the only other countries that have done systematic population genome studies so far have been in um, kind of the far north, uh, Iceland and Finland. And those are Caucasian, fairly homogeneous populations, but um, I, I think for reasons I'm, I won't go into it, are of somewhat less interest. I, I really think the Armenian genome, because it's so ancient, may reveal a lot of interesting medical genetic uh, issues. The, the UK is now doing, I think, 100,000 genomes. Of course, they're a very heterogeneous country, especially these days. So I really think this project could be unique. So we did go to um, Ar Armenia. It was my first time. It was wonderful, like I told you. This is the Molecular Biology Institute in uh, Yerevan. And I, I gave a, a couple of talks there and met all the colleagues. And then at the Yerevan um, Medical School, uh, met other colleagues uh, there. And uh, these are what we've done so far. Uh, we're about to start expanding on it. So it was important to us not only to study just Armenian people in general, but to um, distinguish individuals from various ethnic regions of Armenia. This I don't claim to be any kind of expert. I'm trying to learn as best I can. I find the names very hard to keep in my head. But we've chosen four to begin with, Bayezet, Ezram, Artsakh, and Karpert. And we have roughly five from each group. Um, whole blood DNA, uh, with, uh, with blood was collected, DNA was isolated, and then in our lab at UCLA, we did the whole exome sequencing. And um, one of my molecular genetics fellows did a lot of the bioinformatics, which I don't know how to do, um, looking at tens of thousands of um, single nucleotide changes uh, to see which ones might be more unique to Armenians. And in addition, just for interest, I asked him to look at um, mutations for other genetic diseases that I'm familiar with, for other recessive disorders and, and dominant disorders, the uh, cancer predispositions and so on. And I'll show you the just the beginning data we have, not very okay. good, of, of the four regions. And in my, our trip, uh, we, did, we were in two of them. Yer, well, we were in Yerevan. And then the other outlying one we went to was, was Artsakh, was, which was quite a great adventure. And we got to meet the, um, the prime minister uh, in his office in, in this building in the background. And they were really very enthusiastic about it. It's just they're so far away. and they have even less resources than Yerevan does. But I, I, we were very uh, satisfied and encouraged by their enthusiasm for the project. Just a few things on the data. I'm not going to go heavily into this. Uh, as far as ancestry, this is not new. Others have found this. But at least in our small group, uh, it showed to be the same. So uh, yeah, they, I'll just do it by color. So the Armenian, or if you can see. Here, uh, are sort of the purple squares sort of on the right. Um, they're uh, right next to, if you go upper left, some kind of gold ones. Those are um, Ashkenazi Jewish. And so it kind of proves what I said originally, that the two groups are, are very similar and closely related. And then uh, the green, I think, is um, uh, European. And that's not surprising. The ones that are, the Armenians don't match very well 
are the old, that yellow streak, which is Hispanic from many different countries, um, Arab, and uh, I think uh, South Indian, like India and Pakistan, which is not surprising. Um, I asked my genetics fellow to look at um, mutations in the FMF gene, which is called MEFV for Mediterranean fever, and um, we found a, a handful of them. It turns out to be 17%, which is roughly the 20% one in five carrier rate we would have expected. Uh, I asked him to look at uh, the main genes for familial breast and ovarian cancer, dominant disease, BRCA1 and 2. I know that disease is a big concern in Armenia, at least in this small handful. Um, we did find a bunch of DNA changes, which are listed here that you can't read, obviously, but these are all, as far as we know, benign polymorphisms. They don't cause cancer, which is good news for these people. I have no doubt we will find real mutations as we go further. Keep in mind, though, these are research subjects that have been de-identified, so even if we found a mutation, we're not reporting it back. That was how our Institutional Review Board approved the uh, project. And then, like I said, I asked my fellow to uh, look at some other disorders like uh, phenylketonuria, PKU, which all newborns are screened for in this country, mainly a northern European disease. Um, let's see, familial dysautonomia, which is one of the Ashkenazi Jewish diseases, and a few others here. Uh, each of them we found like 1 to 2 percent carrier rate, which is not too much different than the U.S. population. And yet I don't think anyone gives much thought to these disorders in Armenia yet. And, and maybe, maybe they should, maybe some could be targets of newborn screening. I asked them to look at the P53 gene, which is sort of a master cancer gene. And um, we found a very common, I, I, I shouldn't have called it a mutation, it's really a variant. Um, it's likely benign, it was in the majority of the cases. Um, I only showed it to you because um, people who have actual tumors, about 5% of those will have the same change in their tumor. So it, it may be of some interest in can carcinogenesis, I, I'm not sure. These are all very preliminary. And then cardiovascular disease, I asked him to look at. So there's a family of disorders called, uh, well, familial arrhythmias, long QT syndrome. It refers to something on the EKG. And uh, there are about eight genes. He looked at all of them. I'm just showing you one that showed what, what may be a real mutation, this B476i. Uh, um, again, it's not being reported. Um, what are the symptoms of these arrhythmias? Um, about half the people have no symptoms at all and live a normal life. The other half uh, can drop dead without any warning. Their heart suddenly goes into ventricular fibrillation. There are certain triggers like diving into cold water or loud sounds. Um, this is one of the major ethical issues I've faced in our own clinic and so even if this was a clinical case, I would still have problems whether to report it. I, I don't like to burden healthy people with, with a black cloud that they're going to be paranoid about for the next 70 years when half of them will actually have no problem, yet half of them will have a problem and you know could benefit by uh, having an implantable defibrillator put into their chest. Um, I don't know the correct answer. Luckily, this was research, so I don't have to report it. Uh, but it's something we should always keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, and then the last one was um, familial hypercholesterolemia, mm -hmm. which is the, the severe form of the high cholesterol that many of us have, and that's the reason we're on Lipitor, but these people have really, really high cholesterol and get heart attacks like in their 20s. And um, we found only one variant that might be pathogenic. There's conflicting data in the, uh, uh, in the literature. Uh, this was just going back to the ancestry again, if I can read this properly. The, um, uh, Bayezet was the region that seemed to be least or most distant from Europeans and thus Americans. Now our sample size is small, uh, but we compared uh, these tens of thousands of variants to those of other ethnic groups that are in our database or national databases, and they kind of go from the oldest humans to the newest, left to right here. I know you can't read most of them, but the ones on the extreme left are Africa, because we all came out of Africa. That's the proof both by DNA and by archeological studies. And then um, the more modern populations go more and more to the right. So 
the tan area are um, uh, areas with Armenians from various areas in the diaspora and Armenia itself that others have done. You can't read it, but the one at the extreme left of the colored in area is Bayezet. At the white part on the right, those are USA and UK and Europeans. So it, it looks like Bayezet is maybe the more ancient population, and Ezrun is the one closest to Europeans. Again, I wouldn't conclude anything from 25 people, and I don't know if this fits the, the history of Armenia. There's people in the room who may know that better. So um, in summary, uh, at least what we've done so far, uh, we confirmed that Armenians are most closely related to European Caucasians and Ashkenazi Jews, more distant from Hispanic, Indian, African, not a big surprise. Uh, Bayezet were the most distantly related from Europeans, at least in this small study. We found uh, FMF mutations in the percentage we would have expected as well as some unexpected mutations in um, recessive diseases that are usually associated with other ethnic groups like Ashkenazi Jews and Northern Europeans. So those may be of some public health interest to Armenia. Um, and then at the end, we just will continue to analyze these further. We're gonna get more specimens from other regions and hopefully focus on disorders of, of public health relevance to Armenia, as well as transferring technology. Personally, I would like to find out what's going on with the one-third of FMF patients where I can't find the second mutation. Maybe there is a modifier gene in some other area of the genome that we could find. And so it will involve continued collaboration with our Armenian colleagues, which is great. And this is the backyard of the Armenian consulate in Glendale where I had to get some <laughs> papers. I, I love these little signs. And so it means not only will we be going back to Armenia, but also continue and interact with the Armenian community here, I hope including ARPA, and lots of other opportunities for the <laughs> Armenian community. So uh, I will stop there. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody, for a very interesting presentation. Now it's time for questions. Yes. It's not a question, it's just for the record, for your knowledge, Good. which I witnessed. Uh, okay, uh, I was student medical, 71. Right. Uh, there was a patient which had seven surgeries, a young person, 35 around, and they removed, like you said, but the professor who was teaching us for showing at that patient, he knew about it. And they've learned <coughs> from the doctors from Beirut, Lebanon. Yeah. They went there and taught them before 71. Wow. But not all the doctors in Yerevan knew about it. Good. So that guy had seven surgeries removed. A lot of organs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the Beirut surgeon was Dr. Gurelia, who was, I knew him too. So they were a group and stuff. That's why they put the uh, name Armenian disease, oh. because they were one of the first who found those things. Yes. And the treatment of colchicine, they were recommending that too. Good. Uh, the other thing, when I was here, 82, I went to UCLA library. There were very few books, maybe four or five books about the uh, disease. Wow. And very superficial too. Yes. So uh, if it helps you, I don't know if I remember other things to let you know for Larry. Oh, those are very helpful, definitely. And that, especially so the lack of knowledge. Before 71, yeah. in Beirut, they had done the research and went to Yerevan to teach them. That's interesting. And okay. they didn't know that. A lot of doctors, majority of the doctors in Yerevan didn't know that's why it happened. Yeah. And I should mention another problem of these unnecessary surgeries. For one thing, no one wants unnecessary surgeries. They're unpleasant. They're expensive.
but there's a special problem with FMF patients. When you're cutting into the abdomen, even if you didn't take out anything, they have a tendency to get a lot of fibrosis, fibrotic bands in there, which later the intestine gets tangled up in, and then they need real surgery for intestinal obstruction. It can also cause infertility in the women because it messes with the fallopian tube. But the, the thing is that I never heard that kind of patient in Lebanon, Beirut. I never heard about it. But in Armenia, I saw a couple of them. Yeah, I, and I've been surprised with just the referrals we get from Glendale, there's not as much knowledge among the physicians as I would have hoped. I'm not sure, I shouldn't generalize probably, but that's been my experience. Mr. Kaftari. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, very interesting. Oh good, thank you. I'm a pediatrician, and for many years I thought I do have a FMF. Um, is it possible to have a spontaneous remission, permanent remission? Yeah, that's a great question. In our adult clinic, where we have a few thousand patients, I've heard that from a few of them. We never encourage the people to go off their colchicine because uh, we want to protect against the amyloidosis. We have had some middle-aged men who said, I'm tired of taking this, I'm just going to stop. And their attacks didn't come back. So it's as if it burned itself out. I don't know if that's a rare thing or common. And I'm not sure if that would make them at risk for amyloid again. So I'm still a little worried about assuming that. In my case, uh, the pain stopped uh, around age 60. OK. And the uh, majority of them were not associated with fever. OK. But the pain was excruciating. It was like cutting right in the epigastric area. Yeah, right. But the back, front, the sides, the whole, the whole area. It sounds like you had it. Not everyone gets fevers, yeah. But I assume there's nothing wrong with your renal function. We, we always do a yearly urinalysis just to look for protein. How soon so. do you see amyloidosis? Oh, it takes many decades. So at least for the pediatric cases, I try to reassure the parents that we don't have to start colchicine immediately. They're not at risk for a long time. But we'd like to get rid of the attacks as and soon as we can. My last question is, I thought the name has been changed to polycerocytes. Yeah, you know. Uh, that's a very good point. I, there are people who don't like the name FMF. It, it is a polycerocytis, and that would be a better name. Or you could maybe name, name it after the gene, Pyrin. I remember um, that I, there's, just like um, the Armenian Medical Association, there's um, a biannual World Congress on Autoinflammatory Diseases. I've only been to it once, four years ago, when it was in Switzerland. And I remember there was an Israeli researcher, a very funny guy who was making jokes the whole time. And at one point he got up and said, we've got to change this name, familial Mediterranean fever. It's often not familial, it's often not Mediterranean, and there's often no fever. <laughs> so <laughs> it reminded me of when I was in high school history and we heard about the, um, the Holy Roman oh, Empire no. that wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, it wasn't an <laughs> empire. It's just that this name, everyone knows it now, and it will be very hard to change it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gurdjieff, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you, you for so a lot of my, my time. My question is about uh, how many more genomes, uh, exomes, should we uh, complete in order to have something significant to claim? That's a great question, and really, you're more of a genomicist than I am. Um, I'm the first to admit that 25 is too low. If for genome projects in general, where we're trying to figure out um, what we call VUS's variants of uncertain significance, which we find in patients, we don't know what they mean. Um, the first thing we do is look in the population, and as you well know, we have these databases of 60,000, now I guess it's 120,000, um, supposedly healthy people. And, if the variant is found in 1% of those, we sort of just throw it away because we figure those are healthy. They, they would have shown up by now. But I think you need even more than that. I actually think we won't understand the human genome in general till we do 10 million or maybe 100 million genomes. And that's more than there are people in Armenia. So I, what do you think would be the minimum here to get publishable data? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's certainly more than 25. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, I'm not a population geneticist. I hope we can publish soon, but you know it'll depend the quality of the journal, how powerful our data is. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks for the presentation, doctor. Thank you. Uh, when you say one in five Armenian can have this disorder, 
do you draw a distinction between Armenians from Armenia versus Armenians from the Middle East? Or is it all taken together? Yeah, it's really all together. And remember, one, it's not one in five who get the disease. One in five are carriers. Uh, it, the, a carrier has to have a baby with another carrier, and even then there's only a one in four chance. But that's still a lot of affected people. But yeah, in our FMF clinic, we have Armenians. For, I always ask, you know, when I take the family history, it's obvious they're Armenian, but I always say, where, where did you originate from and where are you now? A lot of them are Lebanon, uh, Turkey, Iran, uh, all, you know, the diaspora. And one reason I ask is um, we found, for some reason, Armenians that where the family never left Yerevan have a higher risk of the amyloid. I have no idea what, why that is. They, their mutations are the same as everyone else. But it, it, we found it important to ask. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, a couple years ago, when some of us were uh, working on the commemoration of the, the genocide, uh, the 100th anniversary of the genocide, we, uh, we did a conference on transgenerational transfer of trauma. Ooh. And while we were doing this, I started digging into the research to try and find out what was done, what other groups that had been exposed to similar experiences had done. I came across studies from Mount Sinai of New York. Right. A couple of Israeli doctors who had worked in Israel and then transferred to Mount Sinai were working on the survivors of uh, uh, the, the families Holocaust, of genocide right. survivors. Right. And they were lo looking into epigenetics. Right. And this, the, this um, study that you are embarking on, that you are entering in, offers fantastic opportunities for, for that particular nexus of uh, neuroscience and genetics. Yes. I was wondering if you would be looking in that direction, if you would be including um, epigenetics uh, views of the, uh, of the information that you will be Yeah, getting. wonderful question. Believe me, it is on our minds. For those of you who are not biology people here, epigenetics is um, something that determines phenotype, you know, some features of the person, and sometimes can be inherited, but it's not in the DNA sequence itself. It, it may be in the DNA, but the sequence is the same. If we run it on our sequencer, you don't see any difference. But if you look at certain chemical changes to the DNA or to the proteins around it, those are called epigenetic marks. And we used to think those were acquired during life, and when the sperm or the eggs are formed in men or women, it, it erases the whole blackboard, you're back to just the sequence. Now we know some of these things stick around and go into the next generation and the one after that. I think the Dutch famine has also shown that. Uh, a few other groups have had horrible things happen to them. Um, the siege of Leningrad, uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of them. I didn't know about the Holocaust one. Um, we definitely want to do that. And one thing I didn't tell you, and Selby can correct me, these 25 are very elderly people, right? Mm -hmm. Or not? No, no. Oh, we didn't use the centenarians? No, we, we tried to get older than 80 year olds, but we may have some. Okay, so it's like a majority, mix. Yeah, yeah. Majority. and many of them, uh, I think, would be children of survivors yes. or grandchildren. So I would love to look at that. It's certainly doable. We don't get that in our basic sequence. We'd have to look at methylation of genes. That, that's epigenetic, but it, it's easy to do. I would love to look at that. Yeah. The reason I'm asking this is the following. We are always surprised as to the fact that we can't snap out of the grief of yeah. the genocide. Generation after generation, this is the fourth generation after the genocide, right. and we grieve. And we don't even know where that grief is coming from and why. I know. And even though we try not to do it and not to pass it to the next generation, we want just the information without the grief. Yeah. It doesn't happen. And I've been aware of that, knowing and your so, community. so, you know, when I was looking into this research area, the really illuminating thing for me was that when major traumas happen, certain genes, gene function, uh, is triggered such that, for example, the depression gene is triggered. Yep. And the, the gene turns on, and it stays on. 
we thought that that, as you said, that goes away with that generation. Right. But evidently, what epigenetics is saying is that that turned on the position of the gene is passed from one generation to the next, such that then the children, even though they haven't heard anything about it, they have the propensity yes. of the same, uh, the, the, the symptoms of the trauma. Uh, there's no question, and I think so, they've done studies in mice and rats where they deliberately right. traumatized them, and even the, gr the third generation still is not acting normal, right? And you know, rats don't have any written history. They, they would know nothing <coughs> cerebrally of what happened. It's clearly in the DNA. But Great it, idea. But do you see a change in the gene of itself after a major trauma? But, uh, it, rather than thinking that probably it has happened, do you have any evidence that, for example, if you have done uh, the DNA testing in someone, and then that someone goes through a very traumatic experience, and then do the same test again on that person, and do, do, you, do you think so? such a study has been done? I, that I don't think, I, I don't think you would see much. If you looked for things like DNA methylation, which is epigenetic, that is, we might see. Other than just radiation exposure, like the Hiroshima survivors, they've been studied uh, for decades, um, they definitely get changes in their DNA and they get cancer. I don't think a purely emotionally traumatic thing, or even starvation, uh, would change the DNA sequence. I mean, you'll get lots of random changes, but there won't be one dominant mutation that would actually change the phenotype. But it won't be visible. The PTSD. PTSD, PTSD, another yes. example. Yeah, I agree with you. There's no doubt that there's a big neurogenetic connection. There's also immunogenetic connection. That they, they can really, they definitely change gene expression. How much they change the epigenetics going forward, we need to study. Yeah. Thank you very much for sure. simplifying such a complex uh, field. It is. <laughs> uh, my question is, you indicated that uh, some people have suffered un unnecessarily because they were not diagnosed at their very young age. Now, how do you do the diagnosis besides fever, pain? Does it have to go through this genetic uh, so there's no other way. Yeah, good question. It really is a diagnosis based on history. It's not even much symptoms because we rarely see them when they're symptomatic. They don't come to our clinic. They might be in the ER and those people don't know what, what they're looking at, unfortunately. So it's just getting a careful history that since age 11, they've had this roughly every month or so. Um, as I said, we'll do the DNA test if, this, if the history is not so typical, but often it's inconclusive anyway. So the best thing is really response to colchicine. Colchicine, as far as we know, works with only two diseases, FMF and gout, and we know these people don't have gout. So that's basically it. And it, the people who don't get diagnosed, whether it's here or in Armenia or anywhere else, it's simply because they're seeing physicians who've never heard of this disease. Yes. So it's not even in their differential, on their radar screen at all. Yes. And it, it's really sad. Um, I had one woman, this is just an anecdote, but. Um, the, the women with FMF actually, um, during pregnancy, uh, they actually feel better. I think it's the same with lupus and things like that. Probably because there's something with the immune system during pregnancy that something has to happen so the mother doesn't reject the fetus, you know, which has foreign genes in it. So it's something gets suppressed in their immune system. And I think if they have an auto-inflammatory or autoimmune disease, it kind of suppresses that. So I saw a woman who was like in her late 40s, Armenian descent, had never been diagnosed until she saw me, so had never been on culture scene. She um, had eight children, because the only time she felt good was while she was pregnant. <laughs> and I felt so bad for her, because the cost of putting eight children through college compared to a bottle of culture scene, it's such a shame. So. One, one quick other question. Does the medication help reduce the symptoms? or the frequency of it? What, what is oh, it? good question. So once we reach the optimal dose of colchicine, which can take a few months, you have to be patient. Uh, our goal is to have zero attacks and then no amyloid. So it's not just less frequent or more mild. If they're getting more mild, I, I know it's partly working, but we need to up the dose. The goal is to never have attacks.
Does it have any side effects? Oh, good, yeah. You'll see on the internet in these chat rooms people saying the colchicine it kills the kidneys. It's just the opposite. Colchicine protects the kidneys. They're really, it's a very safe drug at the doses we use, which are quite low. For a while, the Israeli group thought there were some birth defects if the pregnant woman took it. That's been disproven. I've heard some older people have complained of peripheral neuropathy, but I think some older people get that anyhow. So I'm not convinced that at the doses we give it, you'll see weird stuff on the internet of deaths from colchicine toxicity. That's where they infused it IV, which we would never do, at 100 times the normal dose. It's really very safe. Yes. For the doctor, all the experience I have, uh, most of the patients, uh, 50, after 50s, get less attacks and sometimes no attacks after 55, 60 and they feel totally okay and they stop cold shooting. And yeah. I've, uh, the other thing, if they travel to another country, they have no attacks too, some of them. Yeah. Uh, unknown reason, I don't, I don't know how it explains, but there's a couple of people I know they traveled and they have no young people, old people. Uh, yeah, I, and I've seen patients, maybe like you said, newborn kid. Yeah, I think you're right. There's, although but most they was not diagnosed because they didn't, we didn't know about this, that kids have too. That's right. People used to think it was only adolescent or later. Yes. And it's the pediatric groups especially hard because you know, toddlers are getting viruses every week anyhow, so the pediatrician just sends them home saying it's a virus. I found the pediatric cases, they go two years before they finally see me and get it. But I think you're right, although I've explained this as a pure genetic disease, there's got to be some environmental factors. Some of the patients have seasonal things, like the winter is worse for attacks. There must be some reason why the people who stayed in the Yerevan have more amyloid then the people with the exact same genetics who come here don't. I, I don't know why, if it's the diet or what. Dr. Uh, you mentioned that you had a four-month-old four baby diagnosed with this disease. How did you make that diagnosis? Yeah, it's really hard because <laughs> obviously the four-month-old can't describe the pain. Um, and I'm usually not there when they're having the attack. You know, we focus a lot on the peritonitis aspect of the abdominal pain. And I've learned from my, my gastroenterology colleagues in the FMF clinic how to tell the difference between um, peritonitis uh, compared to luminal inflammation, like from inflammatory bowel disease or gastroenteritis. And they really are different. The peritonitis, you get rebound tenderness. The, the abdomen's hard as a rock, bloated. It's constant pain, whereas luminal pain it comes in waves and it's crampy. Of course, an infant can't tell you that. Um, with them, we do depend more on the uh, DNA, but if that's inconclusive, we'll start colchicine because it's safe in kids too. Yeah, the second question I have is, uh, uh, it's a very basic question, just to refresh my aging memory. <laughs> um, when, you, when you talk about the mutation, you mean uh, the sequence of A, C, G, and T changes? Yes. Right? Right, and the mutation, word mutation, I should tell you, in my field, it's become a very loaded word. People don't like using it anymore because patients, as I told you, different people with the same mutation can have real severe or mild disease or no disease. And it's not just this disease. It's true with cystic fibrosis. So now the geneticists prefer to call them pathogenic or benign ver sequence variants rather than the word mutation. I, I grew up with mutation, so I still use that word. So. Yes. Um, so in the world of uh, you know prenatals, where um, carrier testing has become part of the standard of care, yeah. um, we I work in IVF and we have patients who now are selecting you know to do PGD for the embryo to see if they should transfer or not. Right. Um, and we see that different labs are picking up different polymorphisms. And some say that it is disease causing. Some say it's not. Um, some don't even include it in the testing that is done. So it creates a really large dilemma of which embryos to transfer and which to don't. Uh, are there, is there any um, a publication or is there a data bank that patients can be referred to or 
some sort of standard that all labs can follow? Or is there a study where somebody who has a mutation of a gene and a polymorphism, <coughs> their symptoms being uh, compared to maybe a patient who has the same type and doesn't have it? Are, is, is there recordings of this? Or how, how can we help the patient decide to transfer that embryo or not? Yeah, you've hit on a sore nerve with me, something I didn't include in the talk. Uh, but I have my own publications on it. Uh, my ed editorial in JAMA from a year ago, you might want to look up where I really bash these <laughs> companies that do the expanded carrier screening, like Council. I'm sure you use them. It's different when you're doing, what she's talking about is a, um, a couple that knows they're at risk to have a baby with a genetic disease, but for some reason or another, they don't, they don't want to do standard prenatal testing with amniocentesis and pregnancy termination. Uh, and Catholics, for example, just wouldn't terminate if they're very religious. So there is this technique she mentioned, PGD, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It's very expensive. The insurance will not pay for it, but if the family can afford it, they get sperm from the husband and eggs from the mother. They do in vitro fertilization in separate dishes. You make a few embryos. You let them grow up to the eight cell stage, micro dissect one cell, which doesn't damage them, and do your single cell genetic analysis on that. And as long as you don't find the mutation you're worried about, the rest of that embryo can be implanted in the mother's uterus. What the problem we're facing now, and it's not just with the IVF couples, it's all the couples having prenatal carrier screening. There's companies now testing for 300 different recessive diseases. Most of them I've never heard of. They're incredibly rare. We know nothing about the mutations. I mean, I told you it's hard enough with FMF. These other diseases have never been studied. So as far as any, there are no databases for those real rare ones. FMF, there is the database I showed, but if you go to it, many of the variants, it, there are